Welcome viewers to our ongoing Nuclear Free Future conversation here at the Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and viewers, let's welcome our guests, for all from Fairwinds Energy Education, located right here in Burlington, Vermont. And this is Maggie Gunderson over here, the, the founder and CEO of Fairwinds Energy Education, and Caroline Phillips, who is the, uh, uh, Caroline, the, the title that you have? Program Administrator. Program Administrator at Fairwinds. And Chiho Kanako. Welcome back, Chiho. Nice and, to meet you uh, again. Uh, you were here a few years ago with, with a, a woman from Fukushima. That's right. And uh, our, you are a board member at Fairwinds yep. Energy Education. Now, thank you for uh, having us all, Margaret. Oh, thank you so much for coming. And, and the topic that we have given ourselves is Children suffer nuclear impact worldwide. Now, on March 11th of this year, the, the fifth anniversary of the Fukushima triple meltdown, I heard on the BBC News all about the tsunami with no mention of the, uh, of the uh, meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi. So what is the impact on children? because the, the news media is not talking about this at all. Um, so in Fukushima specifically, in yes. Japan, well, it's yes. actually, it's misleading to say Fukushima children because um, radiation uh, 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 pollution has impacted practically um, half the Japan, half, half of the Jap Japanese uh, island. But uh, they are monitoring, following the uh, health of uh, uh, you know, children who you, who lived in Fukushima uh, at the time of uh, the disaster, and um, I think they keep expanding slightly uh, the definition. But let's say um, out of let's say 300,000 children who were 18 or younger uh, in 2011, um, t today uh, confirmed 116 thyroid cancer cases which is st statistically uh, quite high because prior to that, Japanese um, average was um, three in one million. So you could say um, if you just compare the confirmed uh, thyroid cancer cases among children, which is supposed to be very rare anyway, um, you know, the jump is 30 times. We yeah. also have to look too, I was, I was reading how thyroid cancer has now entered the top 10, I think it's seventh worldwide of most common cancers, which is a very new phenomenon. You have to ask why is that happening as well. Mm -hmm. And also, oh, sorry, also no. we talk about thyroid cancer mainly because that is basically the only thing that's recognized by the uh, WHO, IAEA um, as some, um, you know, disease that can be caused by a nuclear disaster. However, you know, that doesn't mean that other uh, illnesses don't occur. And so, in fact, uh, maybe the worst thing is that the, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that are unreported or undocumented and uh, un things are happening and health-wise in a very negative way. And exactly what is being documented? The, from what we've seen, very little is being documented, mm -hmm. and many of the uh, papers are being destroyed after two years. They're keeping medical records for two years, and then they're destroying them. And there is a conscious effort and an order to doctors to not talk about any radiation sickness, any radiation-induced issues. Um, when Arnie was in Japan in February, he met a doctor who had a clinic, and his clinic was shut down because he either had to say that the people he was treating had no radiation-induced illnesses, or he would not, you know, if he wanted to be paid, he had to say that. And he refused to say that, so they cut all of his funding for the clinic. And it's fallen on, on individuals and people in Japan and abroad for these epidemiological studies. There's not, um, the epidemiological studies that would track these things, like Maggie said, with papers being destroyed after two years, it's really fallen on independent groups to carry on this work. For example, when you look at um, Chernobyl, uh, we just had the, well, 
we don't like to use the term anniversary because it's not a celebratory um, thing, but the 30-year com commemoration of the meltdown at Chernobyl, we look at the cancer rates of children and people and that we know. So knowing that and knowing that at Fukushima we're not keeping these records, it's pretty, it's pretty lax and it's pretty devastating. Are you saying then that in Chernobyl they ke they're keeping a better or have kept a better record? Mm -hmm. Not and are necessarily. They, are, are they treating the children or did they treat the children better? Did they evacuate the children right away? No. In no. Chernobyl? No. No. Like every government that's faced um, a nuclear release, uh, atomic reactor meltdown, um, or any other kind of pipe break and, and huge radiation release, they don't tell the public. It's just kept under wraps because the public already doesn't like nuclear power, doesn't like atomic reactors, and they would want them shut down if they knew how vulnerable they are to the health impacts. Um, but then, um, as um, Chernobyl basically, you know, was in uh, USSR when it happened, but then the whole region uh, became Ukraine and then Belarus. Uh, basically, Chernobyl was in a very near uh, ukraine Belarus border. So I'm, I can talk about what I heard uh, happened in Belarus is that the, eventually the government decided to um, um, give people right to uh, move um, if they live in the area where uh, the annual dose radiation uh, is exceeds, uh, was it five? five so. uh, millisieverts yeah. and but uh, in Japan I think the government is trying to um, what's happening in Japan today so the Japanese government is trying to um, uh, make people stay in the area even the radiation level might be as much as 20 millisieverts per year which um, is so much more than a yeah. worker gets exposed to right. and uh, how are they making they're making people stay there both by convincing them that there's no danger, right? And In part, convincing them there's no danger and pulling the financial support for them to, to evacuate or live in a separate area, especially with um, the Olympics coming to Tokyo. They want to, um, ha since they'll be on the world stage, they want everything to appear normalized. You know, it's a... It's a challenging paradigm. Yeah, and that sort of the government uh, is try, uh, sort of a trying to sort of a put a best face on the situation goes hand in hand with the um, actual victimized local government sort of a desperate desire to keep the uh, towns and cities going. So, you know, so they want, they don't want their municipalities uh, disappear. So they basically accept government funding for rebuilding or remediation because that's the only thing that the money is going to go to, basically. Right. And so that, that's a very unfortunate, uh, you know, their, their priorities, in my mind, um, it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Are, yeah. are you saying then yeah. that they're, they're sacrificing the, the well-being of the children right. Right. for the right. economic issues? Yep. Yeah. Even um, our Fairwind's chief engineer, Arnie Gunderson, was recently in Japan, and he was visiting some of the women that were living in, um, living as refugees who had been uh, living near Fukushima Daiichi and are now living in what they're calling temporary housing, but is sort of turning into more than temporary housing. And most of these women had not ever had someone come and talk to them about radiation doses that they might have been exposed to or were exposed to. They'd never been talked to. The n most news that they were receiving was a written sheet a written that came sheet once a month from Teca, month. Yeah. TEPCO sent a written report, yeah. but never talked about the radiological issues or, you know, and no one told them what's happening and they have a certain stipend and the government's trying to constrain those expenses and not and and move the people back into whatever areas are possible so again so that uh, things look like the country's back to normal and everything's okay as yeah. 
yet as they collect debris, I mean, I'm sure some of your viewers have seen the astronomical piles of what look like trash bags filled mm -hmm. with all this debris that's been cleaned up, allegedly cleaned up. And those, those bags of debris, first off, they're beginning to disintegrate. Second off, they're building incinerators to burn it. And what's, you can never precipitate or a precipitator is a device that's on a stack, so when you're burning to get the particulate out, you'll never get it all, and especially in the case of radiation, so that it's going to be redeposited. And right now, from the areas that they cleaned, all the rain and flooding and snow melt has brought all new deposits of radiation down from the mountains. It's yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and I, I know you, me you mentioned Arnie, Arnie Gunderson, the chief engineer at Fairwinds, and uh, he said that he measured the radiation there, too. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that a little bit? He, he's working with uh, some other scientists who are studying um, both the Japanese scientists, the samples that they took, and the U.S. scientists who are evaluating the samples and uh, they're finding astronomical amounts of radiation even in downtown Tokyo, mm -hmm. out, outside of METI's door. And METI is the regulatory agency over nuclear power. So it's just... Um, it's a, like a ministry of um, trade and you know, industry and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and right out, he, they took, when he and others were downtown in Tokyo, they took samples right there in, in a garden out right outside the door and on the front doormat, and these are really, really high samples. Yeah. It's frightening. Frightening, because people walking in Tokyo then will um, be inhaling that dust. What was that, the film that we saw from Japan that had the mothers who were in an area where kids play and run from middle oh, school? It's a fantastic video, and I can't, I can't recall the name, it's a, it's a mother's organization. Uh, they live in the Fukushima prefecture and they're actually using um, uh, Geiger counters that have been issued by the government and they're walking along uh, the river and I can't recall the name of the river, but it's, you see children. I remember that, it was, uh, yeah, I think, in Fukushima know. City. In Fukushima City, City yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And it, what's really so tragic about it, kids are running along mm -hmm. dirt paths doing gym classes, gym class and track and things like that. And the mothers are right down in areas that are not posted and that can, kids can go after school and play and people do nature hikes and stuff. And the radiation readings are horrific. Yeah. Yeah. What about the food that the children are eating? Which is an interesting thing. That's actually come up recently. Uh, the Associated Press did a great expose um, in Chernobyl discussing children. And uh, so in Chernobyl, there are four zones. They kind of broke it down into four zones. Zones one through three have been declared evacuated zones. And the government um, gave money for people for resettlement and that sort of thing. Zone four, which is roughly 32 miles from Chernobyl, uh, the nuclear power plant, meltdown site, um, they, sort of what uh, Chiho was talking about, they're deemed in a, in a zone that was contaminated but not enough <laughs> by government standards. So these people were promised um, health subsidies. Well, with Ukraine's economic depression right now, these, this government funding can no dried longer up. happen. It's dried up. These kids had free and lunch every they had day. free lunch. Uh, and that and was their main meal. Right. So these kids used to get government-funded um, free lunches that were radio radiation tested. That's no longer. So this really, it's heart-wrenching. Um, this expose follows a mother who's feeding her children foraged mushrooms, foraged berries, um, milk from their cows, and they know it's all they know it's all contaminated but they it's, it's either that or starvation that or so how food and 
contamination of food, this mother that they, they're following, she has four children, and one of the sons, I don't remember if it's the oldest or not, he's eight years old, but they get they do still get tested. The children do still get tested for thyro thyroid issues, and he has an enlarged thyroid. He's eight years old. But she said, what choice do I have? So it's, it's a devastating thing, and we see this 30 years after the Chernobyl meltdown. Fukushima Daiichi is a triple meltdown. Yeah, that was one plant at That's Chernobyl. What, this know, is three, this three, is three times the radiation. Well, so I guess speak a little bit about Jap Japanese food monitoring. Yes. They are um, testing, they say, and it is uh, it is true. A lot of testing is being done, but um, especially uh, produce and uh, from Fukushima, um, I think they're pretty much all tested. However, um, you know, other areas um, outside of Fukushima. Uh, some places are quite contaminated as well, and um, you know if those air, those food uh, vegetables are tested as well to some extent, but not as rigorously. And um, they are testing school lunch um, um, ingredients even in my home of Morioka City, which is 150 more than 150 miles north of Fukushima. Mm -hmm. But that's you know they maybe t test once a week. So it's not like every day. So I actually know a person, a mother, who lives in Morioka City. Um, she started to notice the, uh, her children, um, one was in elementary school, one was in uh, kindergarten, started to f uh, show very unusual um, dishealth uh, symptoms uh, in the summer of 2011. And eventually she, she had her children's uh, urine tested and found that they, uh, they were a fairly, they found a fairly high level of a cesium in their urine, and she freaked out. And so she tested everything and lobbied the school and found out there was a milk that the school was providing. And she begged the school teacher to please uh, change the brand of milk. And, but the um, Japanese you know, uh, educators were sort of, a, especially at the higher level, they're like bureaucrats, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to do things to rattle the board of education. So they t told the mother, we can't do that, but if you don't want to have your children you know, consume our school lunch, why don't you um, make uh, your kids just bring lunch? It was sort of like a threat, right? Mm -hmm. Well, she did. Yeah. And I mean, she was a very courageous person. She was so driven by protecting her children. Yeah. And that really helped, uh, the, um, helped uh, the kids of her children. And Chiho, this is at a distance from Fukushima. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's just a yeah. just a, an example, yeah. but uh, it kind of sort of uh, highlights how difficult it it is to test everything um, that we, you know. When I go to Japan, I basically assume I'm probably eating a lot of uh, food that's contaminated. That's, that's good. What Arnie found when he was there yeah. too, and. There is a lot of people who know nothing about radiation. The government has said that everything's fine for them to be in the areas they live in. Um, he was gifted wild boar, and they tested oh. it, and it was outrageously That's high. That's the worst thing to yeah, eat. Yeah, I know, because they, the boar forage, forage in all the forests that have so much contamination on the mountains, and it's just terrible. So. These, but people haven't been taught, they haven't been told not to eat that. You know, in parts of Europe, they know you can't, still, 30 years after Chernobyl, you cannot eat in Wales, you cannot eat lamb. You cannot eat any of the wild boar in Germany. Yeah. And, you know, they, they, you have to bring, if you hunt wild boar, you have to bring it and have it tested to see if it's clean. In Germany, they have facilities set up for that. So, you know, this is like a real denial of the way people exist. And look at um, the Laplanders, for example. Their reindeer was their diet, and it's still so contaminated, they have to bring reindeer meat into the Laplanders now because the lichen absorbed, which the reindeer eat, absorbs so much of the radiation, the airborne radiation. It's, you know, we have. Um, one of our, our slogans at, at Fairwinds is radiation knows no borders. Mm. 
And it, if whatever country is building nuclear plants or nuclear weapons or having a reprocessing facility, that's a danger to all of us around the globe. You know, I don't know if we, uh, how it was exactly in, um, you know, Chernobyl, but um, what's making situation really complicated and difficult, especially for women, is that um, if you speak out um, and about your concerns, especially, you know, your children or, or whatever, um, they are in turn attacked by the sort of society at, at large. Uh, that they are sort of undermining the recovery effort by bringing unwanted sort of a publicity or, you know, and uh, reputation to the area. Mm. And so they are forced to sort of shut up and suffer quietly. And it is very important for women to actually uh, seek, you know, each other's support. And some people are really trying to make that happen. But it's hard. To me, heartbreaking that the um, you know that that kind of just the basic human instinct you know to protect life is considered to be a, a treasonous uh, act to Protecting the government. Protecting your children <laughs> is treasonous. Yeah, yeah. That's, Arnie saw that clearly. Yeah. Arnie Gunderson, when he was in Japan, um, he met a woman who moved with her three-year-old when the meltdowns occurred, and she moved to an area of Japan that's way south and, and there's no radiation. And the result is now her family and husband are fighting in court to get the child back to an area that's still contaminated and saying that she's crazy because the government tells them everything is okay. So um, they're taking her to court to try and get custody of her child. What you're describing is, is a massive government uh, clamp down on truth and also that impacts both uh, the triple thing health social and economic well-being of, of of the children in particular who we're talking about now but uh, the women and every everyone right and yeah. as so, you mentioned those things I also think those children are the most vulnerable in health in socially and economically they don't have a say they don't have a voice Right, and that they're more like ten times radio yeah. sensitive, so they they su suffer more from radiation. The women are ten times children. Sorry. Children, children. children. Ten yeah. Times, yeah, children. Um, what does that mean exactly? Um, well, the radiation is on the ground. It's in the air they breathe. They're closer to the ground. They're playing in the dust. They're toddlers. tying their their shoes and getting dirt on their hands, and the dirt is contaminated. And they touch their face and their mouth, so they're ingesting radioactive particles, they're running and in, in, playing in the sand and they're stirring all this up and they're breathing it in and th they're just living in a very contaminated world and their bodies haven't matured yet so their organs are vulnerable. Um, exactly, yeah. uh, Cell turnover is faster. Everything, everything. Yeah. In Chernobyl with all the cesium, one of the things they diagnosed and found and they track now is Chernobyl heart which cesium is absorbed into the body, um, just as if it's potassium. And, and, it, and so cesium is there, and it makes the heart develop in different fashion so it doesn't function right. Yes, and, and you're, we're coming to the almost the end of, the, of our, our program here, but uh, you haven't touched on the other things besides the, the the cesium, the tritium, the strontium to the bones, right? Right. That, uh, could you speak a little bit about that, uh, the tritium, and, and is it in the water of... Uh, well, we talk about tritiated water a lot because tritium is, it has the same elements as hydrogen. So it has this, carries the same properties. Water, as we know, is H2O. So tritium easily binds with oxygen creating tritiated water and we talk about that a lot. Tritium also like water binds with air so we have tritiated air. Um, also considering life is life form species whether it's vegetation or our own bodies are typically three-fourths composed of water we have organically bound tritium. Once you get to the organically bound tritium 
I mean, that, that stays in your body for Dr. Fairley, Ian Fairley said up to... Three years. More than that. Is it? I think okay. it was maybe even five. Um, and we did an, Fairwinds has a great podcast with Dr. Ian Fairley who specializes in this, but tritium is found in the groundwater at Vermont Yankee. Tritium has been found in groundwater at Indian Point. Right. Tritium's been found in, um, is it groundwater or being released at, in Biscayne Bay? Is down it, at it's Point. it's down. It's come through these uh, canals where it was released right. from the plant, and it's into Biscayne Bay itself. And in, Fukushima in the ocean. has huge tritium issues with the amount of water that they're having enormous problems containing their contaminated water. Even with the crazy ice wall that they're building that costs, I think it's like a third of a billion dollars to create and now it leaks work. 50 tons of this ice, of ice this water, water every, every day. day. Oh, so the, in Fukushima, I think the problem is that the groundwater uh, is, you know, be, it's from the mountain behind the, uh, those defunct right. reactors constantly, every day, seeping into the uh, reactor buildings, which are basically melted down, three of them, mm -hmm. and uh, something like 300 to 400 tons of water every day. So what do you do with that contaminated water that increased by day? They're putting into tanks, and right, uh, I think they have almost 1,000 um, water tanks, humongous, something like 800,000 tons of water stored in tanks, and they have um, uh, equipment to filter out uh, some of the uh, radionuclides. But tritium is not something that you can, um, filter with out today, today's technology, you can't filter out. Mm -hmm. So basically, you end up with a massive amount of tritiated water that they don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. And so now discussing whether releasing uh, that into Pacific or evaporating or burying, and none of that option is, of course, is advisable, but you know, they are publicly talking about it. And that kind of highlighted the issue of treated water. But in fact, that the uh, treated water is all over the world. It's all I over mean, the world. It, as long as a nuclear power plant operates, uh, you're going to create treated water. And in, in, I don't know about US, but in Japan, I know they're releasing, I mean, those uh, re reactors, they're releasing all into the reactors them. release tritium every day of operation. And so you have the tritiated air, and then it, Gets which can penetrate your skin. Right, which can, and, and then it gets picked up in, and gets, it picks up moisture. The air picks up the moisture and comes down. So you have fallout, tritiated rain falling out near nuclear mm -hmm. plants, atomic reactors all over the U.S., mm -hmm. and, and nobody's aware of this. Well, people might say, what's the problem with treated water? It crosses the placental barrier. <laughs> it crosses the placental barrier. It stays in, in the body. When organically bound, yeah. Yeah, and, and well, just regular tritiated water crosses mm -hmm. the pl placental barrier, and it hits all the organs, and it lodges particles in, in, in your organs, and before it passes through, the, the industry claimed it used to be in the body for only 50 days, but Dr. Fairley has proved that it's in the body for years, and it's just there, and so those isotopes will cause changes in the cells. It'll cause cancers or other illnesses. What you're describing is a is a great. Uh, it's 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 disgusting. Uh, it's tragic. A, a tragic. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, tragic, and it's hard to wrap your head uh, around. Yes, and yeah. it, it's it's so irresponsible and at the same time very much plotted out to be this way. So uh, could you please just address this children, the, the impact of nuclear on children, just uh, as clo for closing remarks now? Well, I, I'm 27 years old, and I think about issues like tritiated air, tritiated water. I'd love to have kids one day. It's a terrifying thought to think I love farmers markets. I love the areas where I live. Have my gardens, have my farmers gardens been contaminated with tritiated water? And what, if that stays in my body for hypothetically three or five years, what does that mean for my potential children? Let alone if, if there's a toddler who's eating carrots that are grown from their garden and you're teaching your child 
you know, you want to eat fresh foods. I mean, but I live safe. But is it safe? Yeah. But is it safe? And I have grandchildren, and or one and another one on the way. So, you know, yeah. it's it's a major concern. I I, I want to protect our future generations, and this industry chooses not to do that. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I just feel like um, people are not given. I mean, people since 1950s are not given a, a say in the matter whether we wanted all this uh, radio radiation pollution. And, well, we don't want. That's, that is a clear statement, right? Yes. And why, why shouldn't it be uh, an okay thing to say? And it's that simple. I mean, we don't want pollution. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And so can we start there? Okay. Yeah. We start there right here. And thank you very <laughs> much, all of you from Fairwinds Energy Education. Thank you. Thank you for having and, us, Margaret. And thank you, viewers, and thank you, Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy.